Good evening, this is Laws 11057, Introduction to Law. It's week three in term two of 2015. Tonight we're going to be covering some things that uh, we should have covered last week. I was um, delayed, um, so we'll try and catch up. I'm very keen this week to receive some initial feedback from you. Uh, for many of you, this is your introduction to university online study or perhaps even university uh, full stop. So if there are any aspects of this course that have been good or bad, um, let's start to hear it. We'll um, invite you to share your thoughts through you crew. And please be honest, we can take it. Um, if there are certain things that you want to change, if there's a different focus that you'd like to consider, please let me know. And um, that'll be a recurring theme throughout tonight. So feel free to add something on the chat facility or ask any questions in relation to feedback generally. I'm going to give you an exam hint straight away. For those of you that are um, keen readers of previous uh, examinations, you might see that the exams that I've set have had a theme about um, dealing with issues to do with Marbo. Um, there will not be a question specifically on Marbo, but there will be a question on separation of powers. And you may be of the view, and I think you should, that Marbo um, has something to do with separation of powers as well. So I'm not going to uh, take that any further, but um, just keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing is that um, generally speaking, I'll have a question about common law, common law equity, etc. I won't do that this term as well. So the exam hints today, I'm afraid, are in the negative. They're not positive hints, but um, uh, I do want to cover those topics tonight, and I'll start doing that now. So firstly, Indigenous Australians and the law. When we talk about Indigenous Australians, we're talking, of course, about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In the Queensland context, specifically the Murray community, and you'll recall, or you may have read, that there was at one stage... Um, recently disbanded, unfortunately, a Murray Court, which was designed specifically to deal with Indigenous um, uh, Queenslanders or Indigenous people in the Queensland criminal law jurisdiction. That uh, was disbanded as a result of a desire of um, the uh, former government to consolidate courts centrally rather than have different courts for different uh, specific purposes. Okay, so Australian um, uh, law I suppose can be sourced back to English law on the one hand and uh, customary law um, through Indigenous um, Australians on the other. And customary law, of course, was very long standing, uh, effectively operating for, well, I suppose you could say tens of thousands of years prior to um, the uh, white uh, settlement, if we can use that term um, now. So according to commentator Catherine Trees, You'll see the comment in uh, The New Lawyer at page 87. Customary law, customary, customary law comprises of elements of law, spirituality, ceremony and business. So there are a few different aspects to it. And often customary law was kept secret. Different people in different parts and uh, people were designated, if you like, or initiated uh, in, to, to have this um, and pass it on. But it, it was very secretive and... Um, I guess a glaring difference between that and the English common law system was the fact that under British law, the rule of law was meant to be uh, widely publicised and known through legal rules. So a very different emphasis there. As I said, there won't be a question on Marbo this year, but it, do, it is very important. Please do read it. Have a look at pages 90 and 91 of um, your commentary uh, for some comments about Marbo and how important it is in the context of Australian law. Um, so there was also no precedent in customary law. Thank you very much, Nick. So uh, precedent um, or stare decisis is very important in, uh, in British law concept. So speaking of Marbo, the Native Title Act was passed the year after Marbo decision, that is Marbo number two, which was in 1992. The Native Title Act was in 1993. And from that legislation there was established a system for determining native title um, applications, and that's done at an, at an executive and a judicial level as well. Uh, then, of course, the flow on from that was the decision in the Whig peoples against the state of Queensland, where 
<clears throat> the court decided that a grant of pastoral lease did not necessarily extinguish native title. Okay, so any questions about that? Any comments? I know that's very quick. That's not to say it's unimportant, quite the opposite, but it's not on the exam, so I'm not going to stress it too much. Any questions? Any comments? All right, we'll move on then. And um, I'll just go to speak of you. Sorry, I should have warned you that you'd be on the um, on the screen there. Um, now, terra nullius, that's also very important. Um, we've discussed that in the context of, of last week. Um, suppose it can all be summarised by the comment made in James and Field at page 91, which is that the present legal position is therefore that Australia was not terra nullius at the time of British settlement. All right, so there won't be a question on that, but please read that, understand it. Now, I mentioned that our law in Queensland in Australia was sourced from British on the one hand and Indigenous law on the other. Um, I suppose we could go back and start talking about the Magna Carta, which was in 1215. So we had the 800-year anniversary of the Magna Carta last month, which is all very exciting. But uh, essentially, King John was, um, I suppose, uh, had no alternative but to execute that document which provided a fundamental range of rights to English citizens. And we still see people in the magistrates and other courts now arguing <clears throat> um, for certain things to apply based on the Magna Carta. But I can say the Magna Carta itself has no direct uh, legal application in Queensland law. Um, so, but what we can t take from the British law is this concept of common law. Now, if I was to suggest to you that common law is used in three different ways, can anyone tell me what I mean by that? So you can come in on the chat facility or if you can just unmute your microphone and come in. So when I say common law, I mean it in three different contexts. So one way to describe it might be to compare it common law versus something else. So common law is through the court, says Jonathan. Yes. Um, the concept of common law through the courts is that previous decisions should be considered through precedent, thank you Rowan, uh, into the future. So that previously decided cases will then provide some indication to future courts how to go about making their decisions. So common law in context number one means precedent law. Um, of course, Nick's made the point very validly, you've got to consider different courts. And um, uh, by that we mean that a decision of a magistrate, um, although legally binding, is not going to be binding on a Supreme Court judge, but it will be in, in the reverse. So you've got to look at the hierarchy of the courts in the context of that as well. So legislation is not normally involved. Emma's come in with the second one. Let's get you to mute your microphone there, if you would. Um, thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, the second is equity. So firstly, we have common law in the context of precedent law based on previous decisions. And the second context is the contrast between common law and equity. So can anyone give me some idea of what do I mean by this contrast between common law and equity? So common law means in one sense, the first sense, the way in which laws are created by looking at previous decisions. The second context for common law is to distinguish it from equity. That's the second context. So I'm looking for a few words. Damages opposed to injunctions. Yes, Jonathan. So that's a very good example of the different remedies which are available at common law compared to equity. So a common law remedy is damages, an equitable remedy, an example of one is an injunction. Yes, so what we're saying is the second context is common law versus equity, and that's different in terms of um, the damages or, or injunctions, for example. I'll just elaborate on that a bit. Shield versus sword, yes, Tim. So um, what we're saying is in um, uh, 
in in that context that uh, equitable principles can be used um, as a shield in certain circumstances. I'll just explain what I mean by this difference between common law and equity. Originally, and I'm going right back in history now, in England, we had the common law courts, which were very black and white. So it was black letter law. If it said something, it was meant to be and interpreted literally, and it was interpreted literally. Elements of fairness didn't really come into it. So we started to see, if you like, a rival system, which um, was where people would petition uh, for royal justice directly based on something that was fair. And by royal decree, they would, see, they would obtain justice uh, based on equity, not necessarily following the strict common law rules. So um, the equitable jurisdiction, which started through the monarchy, eventually became a system which had its own precedence. Uh, so there were equitable precedents on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, you had the common law precedents. And eventually, these things started to merge through the Judicature Act. And um, now we have a merger of common law and equitable principles within the context of Australian law. I know it's a bit it's a bit hard to understand, but you, it's still relevant, um, and there is still a distinction. I mean, look, for example, um, that excellent um, uh, example given by Jonathan was an injunction. So an injunction, for example, is an opportunity for a court to say, you must stop doing that. It's an equitable remedy, but it's only available in certain courts. You can't go to a magistrate's court and ask for an injunction you need to go to a higher court because a magistrate's court doesn't have that equitable jurisdiction to make that type of order. So you can get by without having to explain the difference between common law and equity, but you should really understand it so you get a better understanding of what you can achieve in certain courts based on what powers the courts will have to deal with certain issues. The third context when we use common law is to contrast it to civil law. So Australia is a common law jurisdictional country as opposed to many of the European countries which are based on civil law, not common law. So when we talk about common law, if someone said, what does that mean? You really have to provide um, an answer which says that it, uh, it depends on the context and depending on the context, it could be one of three things. Now, there's not an exam on this, so I can move fairly quickly through it. Are there any questions before I go leave, though? Have I totally confused you? I'm just looking to see. I'll just put you on gallery view. Have I confused everyone? No, we're right? Okay. All right. And I'm just going through. You're all just uh, getting to see who's in the course, and we've got... A few people have blanked out their screens. All right, we'll go back to speaker view. Um, equitable principles, we've talked on those. So this is where the courts have a discretion and they have an opportunity to provide some different remedies that aren't available at common law. So at common law, if you were aggrieved in relation to a breach of contract, you might be able to ask for damages, money. But you wouldn't necessarily get at common law what you wanted. So say, for example, you'd signed a contract to buy a particular piece of real estate, unique, beautiful real estate, and it was just what you wanted. The seller, for no good reason, decided not to proceed with the contract. At common law, you could seek damages for that. And the damages may be the difference between what you uh, paid for it and what it was worth. Now, you may have actually paid more than what it was valued at because it was very important that you get it for your own reasons. So I guess it begs the question, what if the seller refuses to sell to you, what damages have you suffered in those circumstances? Does anyone wish to proffer an opinion? So you've bought a property, you've signed for a million dollars, 
the seller refuses to sell to you for some reason, the court hears that the valuation of the property is $975,000. What can you sue for in damages? Any thoughts? All right. Um, a few answers coming in here now. Loss of time, yes. Uh, could the house be sold in order to complete the purchase? Now have to rent, yes. So your opportunity cost, time and effort, etc. So there might be a few different opportunities available to you, different in funds, loans, cost evaluation, loan fees, settlement fees, legal fees, etc. Yes, I agree with all those things. Emotional state, maybe, but it's limited. So if you're in that situation advising a client who wants to um, obtain an order from the court, you would seek an order of specific performance, which is an equitable remedy. And essentially, um, a court ordering specific performance is compelling a party to do what they ought to have done. So the order for specific performance would be an order forcing the seller to transfer the property to you. Okay, so it's equitable. It's based on what's fair and not necessarily restricting the court to a claim for damages only. There are a few equitable principles. Um, one who comes into equity must have clean hands. Equity looks at the intent rather than the form. So we look at um, what is actually meant by it, something rather than necessarily um, the sort of inflexible rules, uh, strict uh, rules of what's stated. Okay, so let's move on then. Um, in the Development of Australian Law, pages 98 to 102, you'll see the Statute of West, Westminster, 1931. British Parliament would no longer legislate for the Commonwealth without, without its request. And then in 1986, the Australia Acts uh, came into force and that effectively severed all ties between Britain and Australia in that sense. When I was studying, um, we would often look at English cases to determine what is the law in Australia because um, at that stage, the Privy Council was still the highest court in terms of appeal systems in Australia, only just, but um, now, of course, it is the High Court. So the Privy Council was essentially like the House of Lords, but for the colonies, if you know what I mean. So English law then was more important than it is now. Any questions about that? Okay, so there won't be a question. There won't be a question in the examination about all that. Let's now talk about the Australian legal system. I'm on to chapter four of the text, and there are seven characteristics identified: the rule of law, liberal democracy, common law legal system. Hopefully we know what that means now. Constitutional monarchy, federation, separation of powers. There will be a question about that. And responsible government, which also relates in a sense to separation of powers. So read those and um, make sure that you understand them. Okay, let's move on to what should be part of, uh, should be the start of week three material, which is chapter five, the sources of law in Australia. And... Um, I'm just going to break for a moment to just get a quick idea from you and I'll just put you on gallery view now. I hope you don't mind. If you don't want to see your face on the screen, you can always blank it out. But, um, oh, we've got lots of people on that screen have blanked out their faces. Um, for the examination, or the assignment rather, can we just get a thumbs up? Are we generally understanding what needs to be done or are we completely lost? So we're, we're mostly okay. We understand. All right, that's good. Good, all good. We're getting the um, is the is the uh, indication. If there are any issues in relation to it, I think the best place to ask is you crew. But don't be too hung up about it. If you are struggling, if you're watching this video and you're struggling, uh, don't be. Um, it's an opportunity just to get used to the regime. And as I keep saying, have a look at the way that. Legal writers will reference their material and uh, have a look at cases and that will give you a really good idea of how you should go about referencing your material. 
All right. Um, you don't need a cover sheet. Um, it's probably preferred. Uh, there is a specific type of cover sheet which is used by the university. I tend not to use that or ask people to use it. So feel free to use any form of cover sheet if you like. I think it just probably looks a little bit better, that's all. Okay, any other questions about the assignment, about what's required of you? All right, we'll move on. And I can't say too much because I think at least one student has already submitted work. Quick citation reference on page 223 of the, the text says, Scott, thank you very much. That's a good hint. The Australian Guide to Legal Citations is really tough reading. I appreciate that. That's why I keep referring you to what others do so you can learn through osmosis rather than necessarily trying to digest the formal material. One thing that you will find as you study law is that uh, people will ask you questions. They, they, they'll, they'll ask you all sorts of questions and they'll assume that you know something about the answer. In one minute, people will ask you a question about family law, then contract law, constitutional law, or they might ask you some obscure question about traffic law. So uh, just get used to that, um, but don't think that um, by doing this course or even practicing for 40 years that you're going to know all the answers. Um, so I think uh, I've been practicing or studying law pretty much every day since 1977. And uh, there's so much more that I don't know than I do know. So just get used to that paradigm. Um, and don't think, don't put too much pressure on yourself by thinking that you must know all the law. Um, another question about the assignment. Would you like sample paragraphs to answer questions or dot points? I'm not a big fan of dot points. I'm not saying you can't use them, but I don't like them because people can easily gloss over them. If you see a list of dot points, I mean, as a reader, I tend to just go to the next part of the narratives and almost leave the dot points as something that I'll refer to if I need to. It's, um, it's not the most creative way of writing, so I'd prefer you didn't, but I'm not saying it's wrong. The other thing, um, so can't know all the law, but the key is to identify the law in question and know where to start looking. Thank you, Rowan, for that contribution. That's absolutely correct. So, and the other thing that people will do is they'll say, well, as you know, under the Traffic Act, you're not allowed to do this, or you're not allowed to do that, or you must do that. And uh, people will just sort of assume that you know these things and uh, don't be afraid to correct them and say, well, actually, I don't know, but, you know, I, I, at least I know where to look. I know the appropriate channels to look for. All right, sources of law in Australia. Legislation overrides common law. We all know that. Not every legal situation or dispute can be decided purely by reference to legislation. All right, so just as, as a refresher, we have the primary sources, we have the secondary sources. I like you to go to the primary sources first. So if you have a legal question, my preference, don't go straight to the textbooks, go to the legislation. If you can't find the, the answer in the legislation, have a look at the case law. If you can't find it there, then go and have a look at the textbook. I mean, you can do all three in conjunction, but don't think that the textbook is necessarily the best place to look because it's the secondary source. It's not the authoritative source. That's where legislation and case law um, should be considered. All right, and just bear in mind, of course, that um, if you are concerned that you're not able to answer a question definitively, um, that, that shouldn't surprise you. We have lots and lots of legislation. We have a lot of case law. But not everyone is going to read the legislation the same way. Not everyone will come to the same conclusion in relation to a legal dispute. I mean, if, if that was the case, we wouldn't have cases. And we have thousands and thousands of cases. And presumably, in many of those cases, we have competent lawyers on both sides urging uh, perhaps or providing advice um, when clients are proceeding. So everything is, in a sense, open to interpretation, and that's why it's important that you're able to argue and persuade. So if you have a, a, an offence of um, driving, it's an offence to drive without due care and attention, 
then I suppose the question might be, are you committing an offence if you cause an accident as a result of changing radio stations um, or changing something on, a, on the dashboard, changing the air conditioning to increase the fan? I mean, just as a straw poll, does that necessarily mean that you are guilty of an offence of driving without due current attention if it's an accident? Who says yes? You change the fan, yes, no. Yes, yes, yes. Not necessarily, somewhere in between. Yes, maybe. No, negligent. No. All right, so we're getting a divergence of opinion. So tomorrow when you're driving and you think this um, fan is on a bit, it's a bit strong, I need to turn it down a bit. Are you going to reach over and just turn the fan down? Or are you going to pull over, come to a complete stop, adjust the fan setting and then recommence the, uh, the drive? I mean, many of you have said, yes, it is, it is an offence to drive without due current attention if you change the fan. So, um, you know, that's another way of looking at it. All right. Um, so case law eventually becomes part of the law um, through common law, doctrine of precedent, stare decisis. Just remember, of course, that you need to consider which court it is that is uh, making the decision as to whether it will be binding on others. Now, did someone have a question there? That was a no? All right. If you do have a question, please just unmute your microphone and uh, jump straight on in. All right. Um, now, of course, I, th I presume that you're able to look up the procedure about how a bill becomes ultimately a law. It'll progress through a number of readings and ultimately be, uh, obtain uh, royal assent. Just um, remember this, though. For legislation to become law, it requires the assent of the Crown. I'll talk more about the Crown shortly, what it means. But there are some things, there's a couple of little tricks here. Sometimes it is very clear when you're looking at legislation what is the day of assent, um, which will be the day that the law actually becomes um, part of our uh, body of law or the act becomes, becomes law. But it's not necessarily the case. So in Queensland, for example, if there is not a date of commencement, which is quite common, then you need to consider the Acts Interpretation Act, 1954, Section 15A, provides that the effective date of the Act is the date of assent. To determine the date of assent, you need to check the Queensland Government Office of um, Parliamentary Council in that particular year. And if you go to the website, you'll see the date of assent. And Section 15A of the Acts Interpretation Act provides that an Act commences on the day of assent, except um, so far as the Act otherwise pr provides. Now, I've spoken very quickly about that. But what I'll get you to do, and this might be relevant for the second assessment piece, make sure you have a look at Section 15A of the Acts Interpretation Act. There's a little hint for the second assessment. In the Commonwealth arena, you need to consider um, the date of uh, commencement. Have a look at the Acts Interpretation Act of 1901. Have a look at Section 3, capital A, subsection 2. Is another little hint. And the reason I'm raising the Acts Interpretation Act now is that it's another little trick. You see, you might believe that in relation to an issue to do with a dispute regarding powers of attorney, the only place you need to look at from a legisl legislation point of view is the Powers of Attorney Act. But always you need to consider whether the Acts Interpretation Act has something to say about the particular um, law as well. Okay, um, so there is an Acts Interpretation Act, so I'll give you a, a chance to have a look at that. Now, you've heard me talk about this thing called the Crown, capital C R O W N, Crown. Now, what does that mean? It's an institution in Australian law. All land and natural resources, subject to native title, derive from the Crown. Governor General says Rhiannon, question mark. Title to land and resources that have not been transferred to private ownership remain with the Crown, the Queen, yes, 
Uh, owned by the sovereign, yes, question mark. In non-monarchies, the concept might be described as the state or the people. Have you heard that in American movies? They might talk about the people. It was a movie, wasn't it? The People Against Larry Flint. So that's the concept overseas. Now, the crown is not the government. So the government of the day is not the crown. The government is responsible for the affairs of the crown. Gosh, it's all very quick. It's all very tricky, isn't it? Lots of words. Legal personality of the state. Oh, I like that one. That's good. Thank you, Steve. The legal personality of the state. That's a good answer. Sometimes you hear of legislation being expressed to bind the crown. What does that mean? This legislation binds the crown. And I've just said the crown is not the government. So who the heck is the crown? All right. Perhaps the best way I might describe this is by giving an analogy because I really would struggle to provide a specific definition. So I'll just try to paint a picture for you. Um, if you think about a household, that is to the nation, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, what, the household is to a family what the crown is to Australia. Okay, so in a family you might have mum and dad and three kids. That's the family, and they're the members of the family. Um, now, the kids grow up and they leave home, but they're still part of the family, even though they're not residents of that home. So maybe what I can say is that for the, the, the actual house, the household, that's what we really mean by the crown. That's that concept that generally describes if you like, the family. So in the context of Australia, all the people that live in Australia, the, the thing that I suppose binds everyone is this concept of the crown. So the governments come and go, the people living in the house will come and go, but the household, the crown always stays there. And uh, it's not the government, it's not the executive, it's just sort of this concept, if you like. All right, and you will see it in, in the context of prosecution. So um, in Australia, it will be often the describe, a case might be described as the crown against someone, um, particularly in the higher courts, and they will specifically refer to that. So the, cr the crown presents an indictment. Well, actually, it's a prosecutor um, from the DPP, but it's referred to as the crown. So again, it's that difference between what we say in Australia compared to what may be said overseas where it's the state or the people. All right, so delegated legislation is um, interesting. In the context of, um, so I like to think of the Crown as a company and the government as the board of directors. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, I like that. All right, so delegated legislation is interesting. Um, we talked about the separation of powers, and it's not strict. We know that. So in some instances, Parliament has the ability to delegate legislative-type rules to the executive and that might be done through ordinances or bylaws so delegated legislation is where parliament essentially says to the executive look we're going to give you free reign and you can create some bylaws and ordinances to deal with the um, nuts and bolts if you like because parliament just wouldn't get through all its work if it had to deal with all the nuts and the bolts um, on how things work so delegated legislation is where Parliament allows the executive to do some things for it. And um, it may save some time in the long run because it will cater for changed circumstances or maybe some unforeseen circumstances. So Scott says workplace health and safety regulations. Yes. So things of that nature um, uh, you know, can provide some examples of delegated legislation. The other thing that I want you to do is um, have a look at the difference between um, the types of monetary limits which apply for courts and tribunals and the different types of court processes. So I'll just talk about the monetary limits first of all. I mentioned earlier tonight that if you want an injunction, you can't necessarily, well, you wouldn't go to the magistrate's court. 
you have to go to the appropriate court. Now, can anyone tell me this? If you had a breach of contract matter where you're alleging damages of a million dollars, where do you think you might go to have that matter dealt with? Which court would you go to? Supreme Court, Supreme Court, Supreme Court, High Court, eventually, Supreme Court, Supreme Court, Supreme Court, Supreme Court. Over 750, says Liz, that's the, that's the limit. Now, there are other courts, though. Um, it may be the federal court, if, if you've got some element of a um, Commonwealth legislation involved. Now, the district court deals with matters between the monetary limit of the magistrate's court and up to, the, uh, up to its own limit. So the, the limit on the district court at the moment is 750. Um, magistrate's court, the current limit is $150,000. That's it, so 150 to 750. So if you've got a dispute in relation to, let's say a, an estate, and the estate is, uh, has a total value of $650,000, then you would bring your application for family provision in the district court. Supreme Court is unlimited. You can potentially bring a very small matter before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court won't like it and they'll probably try to toss it back to where it should be and probably make you pay the costs associated with being there in the first case. But if you are able to successfully complete the matter in the Supreme Court, um, and, and if you win, you might only get the costs which would have otherwise been awarded in the magistrate's court. But so generally speaking, go to the correct court in Victoria, we have the county court, which is the same thing as the district court in Queensland. Yes, Bill. So, in, so even though in Queensland we call it the district court, that doesn't mean it's the same thing throughout Australia. For example, in, the, in Victoria, the district court is called the county court, so it's a different thing. QCAT's a bit interesting. Um, in QCAT, we have essentially three different thing, rules. The first is that, uh, well, two really. Um, we have the minor debts jurisdiction, which is up to $25,000, and that's for consumer complaints and things of that nature, rental bonds, stuff like that. Um, and magistrates will often hear minor civil disputes uh, or minor debt matters, um, and we have specialist people. Otherwise, I'm a, one of the members in QCAT, and we tend to deal with other things, and our jurisdictional limit is actually unlimited. So, for example, but, but only in the context of the things that... QCAT can hear. Um, so if, for example, there is a dispute in relation to a residential building contract and the damages sought for that are a million dollars, then that can, that can actually be dealt with in QCAT. So it's, it's, a, it's a very strange system in that sense. Any questions there? Any comments? No, we'll move on. Uh, there are two different types of court processes. On the one hand, we have what we might call the adversarial and the other we have the inquisitorial. What does that mean? What's adversarial, adversarial, and what's inquisitorial? Any quick, quick, quick answers coming through? One against the other, yes. And they're kind of both one against the other in a way. Adversarial, two parties competing. Adversarial equals criminal. Yeah, that's an example. But it can be that we can have equity, not quite, not quite. Put it this way, in a court case, in a traditional court case in Queensland, the judge won't get involved very much. And the barristers representing the parties are there to fight for their client's cause. So it's one against the other and the judge makes the impartial decision. Inquisitorial, the judges are more involved, thank you. So the judges get really get into it and inquire. So again, in some tribunals, say QCAT for example, it will be a far more inquisitorial process than it would be in a court system. And um, what do, one, it'll never say, you'll never actually see it written down, this, in this court or this tribunal, it's inquis coroners, inquisitorial. Thank you, Rowan. That's a good example. Um, 
it'll never actually say it, but there are some hints. So, for example, in a tribunal context, you might see something to the effect that um, uh, the tribunal uh, can inform itself as it sees fit. That's a big hint that it's going to be an inquisitorial um, aspect. And the two aspects aren't completely separated. It's not as though there's a declaration to say these proceedings will be dealt with in an adversarial way or an inquisitorial way, crime and misconduct uh, or crime and corruption hearings, yes. Um, that, that can be very much inquisitorial. Um, so it, it won't necessarily be openly stated, but you need to consider the legislation that gives rise to the uh, matter in the first instance as a hint. Now, addressing the ju uh, judiciary, if you um, should meet up with a judge in a private context, what would you call him or her? Um, in the inquisitorial, the judge or the tribunal member can question the witnesses, yes. They can in an adversarial way as well, but they have to be very guarded. All right, so in a private context, I'm getting a lot of your honours, depending on which court, says uh, Lisa. Now, in your, if you're in court addressing the judge, it will be your honour. So that would, that's a given. But what about in a social context? Depends on the judge in a private context. Judge, yes, I like that answer. So the, the answer really I was looking for is this. The same person who you address in the courtroom as your honour may be addressed differently in a social context. So, for example, it's very often in a criminal law jurisdiction for, um, and family law for judges to host a circuit dinner for the practitioners to come along. And on, in that social context, the usual address would be judge. Would you like some, would you like some water judge or have, are you ready to water judge, etc. cetera. Um, first time your honour, afterwards judge or by name, yes. Um, and it does depend on the judge a bit. In a social context, I wouldn't say your honour. I, would I would always say judge. Um, and the, some judges or magistrates may ask you to uh, address them by first name, but you would never presume that, ever. Um, in a magistrate, uh, a magistrate socially or a QCAP member would normally be Mr or Mrs or Ms, um, not your honour or judge for a magistrate or a member. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, it would be good for you to start to, the reason I'm telling you this is, I want you to start to feel part of the profession now. Um, and it would be good if you had an opportunity to meet members of the judiciary or magistrates and um, have an opportunity to engage with them uh, if that's possible. All right, now we're getting over time now, but I just want to talk about two concepts and then we're done. And you can ask questions about this. It's to do with procedure. And there's a basic distinction between criminal law or criminal trial procedures and civil procedures. And um, I want, rather than just talk about the trial itself, I want to go a bit further and talk about the overall procedure. We might make this examinable, I think. Yeah. All right. So criminal trial procedure. Let's go right back to the start. Even before the trial, even before the person is charged, you get a call from someone from the watch house wanting to speak to the partner in the firm that you're in. No one's available. They've put it through to you. You're the most junior lawyer in the place, but you're it. You've got to answer. You've got to deal with it. Client says, I'm in the police station. They've picked me up. They want to ask me some questions. What should I do? Now, are there any thoughts? Don't say a word. Yeah, I like that. Don't say anything. Yes. Silent. Okay, we're getting the idea there. Wait for me. Yes. Say nothing, but be careful how you say it. Don't say anything. Don't say a thing. All right, so plenty of those answers coming through. I'll just give you an idea of what I say. Um, so I get a call from the client. The police have picked me up. They want to say something. I will normally um, ask to speak to the officer first. 
I'll then ask the officer if, um, uh, my, I'll make sure I I'll see if I get all this right, but has my client said anything? If so, what has my client said? Um, if the client, if the police officer says, well, they said something, I'll say, do you intend to use that as part of the evidence? Or was that, was that something that won't appear in a statement? And, um, and, they'll, and you've got to be a bit careful and, and because I know a lot of them, it's a bit easier, but what you're trying to do there is identify what has already been said, which will be part of the evidence. Generally, the answer will be no, they haven't said anything at all. All right. Then I'll, I'll try to say, well, are you going to charge my client anyway? If um, whether he or she gives a statement or not, are you, have you formed the intention to charge this particular person? And quite often the police officers will be up front and say, yes, we have. And um, we will charge this person, um, in which case it makes it a bit easier. Then I'll ask, if, okay, if you are going to charge, is there going to be an objection to bail? Um, they may say, well, we haven't determined that yet, in which case I'll say um, something like, well, uh, you know, it might be at night, for example, let's, let's take that scenario. Um, all right, well, if there is an objection to bail, um, could you please let me know so that I can then be in attendance for the bail um, application tomorrow morning? Um, the, um, the next thing is to uh, speak to your client and say, it's entirely a matter for you, but you, you understand you have the right to remain silent. I would uh, urge you to exercise that right. I would suggest you don't make any statement at this stage, um, unless you particularly want to. Um, but be aware, of course, that um, police have information which uh, you don't have yet. Um, so let's, you have the right to silent. You don't have to prove anything. The police have to prove everything beyond reasonable doubt. So let's see what they say first. Uh, that's generally the way it would normally go. Um, and I think you should, uh, and it was, I saw on the chat facility, police will um, be recording everything um, and uh, they, they shouldn't use any recording of you uh, and your discussions with them. But uh, anything which is said by the, um, by the clients, um, you know, can potentially be used in evidence. Police, of course, are required to provide certain warnings, and if they don't provide those warnings, in most circumstances, that will create some difficulties in terms of using any evidence that they may have put forward. But that's not necessarily always going to be the case. So, um, just uh, and Nick has suggested that your client is to understand the caution, and I think that's that's good advice as well. All right, so that's the first thing at the watch house. Um, second thing is, after the arrest, there will be this question of whether there's um, an objection to bail or a bail application uh, or a notice to appear or a bail undertaking. I'll just explain that. There's two different ways it can go. From the watch house, um, the police could object to bail, in which case the matter is determined by a magistrate. Not if it's murder, that'll have to be a Supreme Court judge, but otherwise, generally speaking, a magistrate. Or they might release your client from the watch house and say, all right, we'll sign this bail undertaking, which is essentially a promise, a commitment to turn up uh, at court. Um, if they don't get actually, actually get to the watch house in the first instance, it might just be a little notice to appear, just a little slip of paper. So we need to work out, firstly, what's going to happen. Yep, notice to appear. Um, then once the client is charged, we need to make a preliminary jurisdictional determination. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, we were talking before about not every court deals with everything. Um, you've got to understand, of course, that it works both ways. So a magistrate has essentially no power to deal with anything to do with a murder charge. The magistrate can't deal with the initial well, sorry, it can't de the magistrate can't deal with the initial bail application and the magistrate won't hear the f matter finally. It will go through a committal process in the magistrate's court, but it's not determined in the magistrate's court. On the other hand, there are things that just won't get to the district or the Supreme Court because they're simple regulatory offences. So someone picked up for shoplifting a $2, um, you know, Mars bar or whatever it might be, well, that's not going to go, you're not going to be able to get that before a Supreme Court judge. 
that'll be dealt with in a magistrate's court, a summary matter. So certain summary matters and um, regulatory matters are dealt with in the magistrate's court complex. But then it gets a bit tricky because we have this thing called indictable offence. Thank you, Ash. An indictable offence, strictly, is an offence which is sufficiently serious to warrant it being the subject of an indictment. An indictment is just a piece of paper, really, and it's presented by a prosecutor in the district or Supreme Court to kickstart the proceedings at that, at that higher level. So not every offence can be indictable or is indictable. M many of them are summary matters. In 2010, the law changed. The Moynihan reforms meant that many indictable matters are now required to be dealt with summarily. It's a bit confusing. So they're indictable offences, but they're required to be dealt with in the magistrate's court, which means summarily. Very confusing. Um, but you need to know these things if you're going to practice in, say, criminal law jurisdiction, kind of that basic threshold question of which jurisdiction is the appropriate jurisdiction for me. Um, once the matter gets into court, we then determine whether it's going to ultimately be proceeded, uh, dealt with by a magistrate or a judge, judge being in the district court or Supreme Court. And if it is going to be dealt with by a judge, uh, typically it will go through a procedure called a committal. And the committal is really a screening process where the magistrate decides whether there's enough evidence to warrant the matter going to a district court judge or a Supreme Court judge. The test for a magistrate is whether any jury properly instructed could reasonably find the person guilty. In other words, may find them guilty. There's enough there that a jury could find them guilty. Not, not will, not probably will, not maybe, not likely to, but might, may. So it's not a big threshold to overcome to get past the committal, to get to the higher courts. But that's the procedure we would follow if the matter is ultimately going to be dealt with in the higher courts, at least most of the time. The other procedure, and this is where most of the offences are dealt with these days, it's in the magistrate's court and we don't go through a committal, we don't have that screening process, but there are some procedures involved and we might talk about that through you crew as well. All right, so that's a very brief introduction to criminal trial procedure, starting at the watch house and ultimately having it determined. It is examinable, so I do want you to, to, to know something about that. And uh, then we have civil trial procedure, also examinable, um, and this can be kick-started through a claim or a statement of claim, a claim and statement of claim, or maybe a summons or maybe an application. So there are different ways to kickstart civil procedures. And again, we've already alluded to the fact that there are different courts or tribunals where these matters may ultimately go. So we need to know something about this, and I want, I'm going to put this on the exam. So uh, it could be to do with criminal procedures, it could be with civil procedures, or it might be with both. But I want you to have a good understanding of that so that um, when you start to practice, You've, you've got these concepts clearly ingrained in your mind. Okay, we might talk more about that through you crew as well. Now, are there any questions? We've all gone silent because I've started talking about exams. Is that right? I'll put you on gallery view. If you're shy, just push the uh, video. All right, we've still got most people there on that screen. So are there any questions before we move on, before we finish up rather? No, just taking notes. Just taking I've got a quick question, if it's all right, please, John. Yes. Thanks, Kimberly. Will there, oh, sorry. Will there be some kind of like um, revision that touches on everything we need to know prior to the exam, or should we just assume that everything we touch on in Zoom might be relatable to the exam? Uh, yes, I think the short answer is everything that we touch on in Zoom would be examinable, everything in the material, everything through UCREW, Moodle. It's all potentially examinable, but I will give you some pretty good hints and we will do a, um, a review of sorts at the end as well. Thank so, you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have one quick question, if it's yeah. all right. Absolutely. Thanks, Helen. 
It's just an assignment question. With the fifth question in regards to relevance, um, mm -hmm. it, kind of, it asks you for your um, like opinion, sort of. And I'm just wondering if we should be writing in first person. So I've just always been in the back of my mind never to write in first person for assignments. But in this particular case, it seems like we need to. So I just wanted to know. <laughs> yeah, that's the, I mean, that's a, a really good question because if I ask for your opinion or your thoughts on the matter, then it's very difficult to avoid writing in the first person. So I have no problem with that. I hope that answers your question, Ellen. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, John, when you were discussing about whether people should speak to the police or not, Yes. what happens if someone does not have the capacity to understand that they oh. don't need to speak or that they can actually ask for a lawyer but they talk anyway but they don't have the yeah. capacity to understand oh that's that's an excellent question um and there are some really good notes in relation to the issue of capacity and uh, the way in which lawyers now should deal with people with uh, impaired capacity i do a lot of that in qcat as well for guardianship and administration um look the short answer is that if something is said um, and it is otherwise admissible because police have followed all the guidelines, as defence lawyers, we have to live with that and somehow deal with it after the event. One of the ways to deal with it is to argue that the admission should not be presented to the magistrate or to the um, jury because it was unfairly obtained. Uh, so that might be one avenue. And the other is, if the um, person's incapacity is so great that they really had no uh, ability to, they're not fit for trial, then the matter could potentially be referred to the mental health court and dealt with in that jurisdiction uh, rather than the court proper. But it, it is an issue. Um, client's capacity is always a problem. I hope that's yeah, answered. Like I know in Mackay, when we deal with the detectives, that one of their protocols is to see if QCAT has appointed anyone. Yes. Um, if not, they come to our work and we sit in with our clients and make sure they understand. But mm -hmm. there's still a lot of people that, I suppose, go through that loophole where they don't have enough decisions in their life for QCAT to be appointing someone if there's nothing serious happening. Yes. So it's one of those people that may not necessarily have capacity but don't have anyone appointed because nothing serious enough is going on in their life to have someone appointed through QCAP. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's quite a threshold to get an appointment of a guardian, a legal guardian, through QCAT. Um, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do, and it's not necessarily something that will happen before the event. But I, I agree with all those things that you've said, Tamara. That's excellent. Um, and... Scott is saying the judge's rules apply, yes, which deals with the issue of fairness in the, and the admissibility. Um, the police do need to go through that cautioning process, but um, Tamara's right, there are issues that may arise in relation to a person's capacity. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions or comments? Just one last question, sorry. You're right. What happens if the police are having general chit chat in the car on the way to the police station. Mm -hmm. Yes. If they, haven't given, if they haven't given them their rights to remain silent and they do talk in the police car, is that still able to be used? It can be, but it's much easier to have it um, um, ruled inadmissible because of those circumstances. But I think the, the general rule, and Lisa's alluded to it now, the police do record everything and... Um, uh, certain admissions can be presented as part of the evidence, even though the caution has not been administered. So that would become a legal dispute. Uh, in an indictable matter, a matter before a trial, that would be the subject of a pre-trial argument. So Scott says, written record of interview to be read. Verbal is it the derogatory term used in New South Wales, previously used in Queensland as well. A lot of that was changed as a result of the Fitzgerald reforms in that regard. Voir dire, for, says Scott, the voir dire is a pre-trial procedure um, where certain um, deal issues of admissibility of uh, evidence, such as confessional evidence, is dealt with 
uh, as a little trial within the trial, I suppose is a way of describing a voir dire. So thank you for those contributions. All right, well, we've gone a bit over the time that I'd normally like to. Thank you all for your participation tonight. Thank you very much for participating through you, crew. Keep at it and um, look forward to the discussions during the week. And we'll see you next week as well. All the best. Bye.